on this place. It's called Imuzar. He said of these people that they were living on olive harvesting, and it seems they are still doing the same thing until today. Olive trees surround an area of five miles around the city. The inhabitants are wealthy, but they wear clothes stained with oil because they make oil throughout the year and take it to fest to sell it. It's the best olive oil you can ever taste. By this time, the early 16th century, European explorers and traders had a good knowledge of the coastal regions of Africa and were even beginning to travel up the great rivers. But the heart of the continent, darkest Africa, was the great unknown. It was Leo's travels outside Morocco that changed the way Europe looked at Africa. And his travels helped inspire a generation of travelers who were to follow in his footsteps. In the early 1500s, Leo began a series of journeys outside of Morocco, ranging as far afield as Egypt, Turkey, and even the Arabian Peninsula and Mecca. But it was one destination above all that caught the imagination of European emperors and travelers, Timbuktu, a name that's synonymous with mystery and danger. The fact we've heard of it at all is entirely due to Leo Africanus. Merchants on their way to Timbuktu have to cross the desert. They cross at its widest diameter, causing the death of many men and animals. Those who survived would find themselves on one of the great rivers in Africa, where traders in canoes met camel trains from the desert. So here we are. This is Kabara port, which is the closest point of the river Niger to Timbuktu. This large town stands about 12 miles from Timbuktu upon the river Niger. And here are merchants that travel to the kingdoms of Guinea and Mali. Leo made two trips to the Sudan and Timbuktu, one in early 1510 and one in 1513. On the first trip, he was an apprentice, a companion to his uncle, sent as an ambassador to Bilad al Sudan, literally, the land of the blacks. The purpose of his second trip was more mysterious. It could have been another diplomatic mission or even a spying mission covered by trade. One of the most lucrative commodities was salt blocks. Salt would come from the north by caravans. It would take them about two to three weeks to reach Timbuktu. They sell this in return for gold. Salt is in very short supply because it is carried here from Tiraza, 500 miles from Timbuktu. I happened to be in the city at a time when a load of salt sold for 80 ducats. Here, a pound of salt could be exchanged for a pound of gold. Timbuktu was a city of unparalleled riches. It was claimed that by the 14th century, two-thirds of the world's gold passed through Timbuktu. Long known to the Arab world, it had been closed to non-Muslims for hundreds of years. Leo Africanus was the man who brought the European obsession with Timbuktu because it was his portrayal of the city as a place of incalculable wealth that got Europe all fired up. The British, the French, the Germans, the Italians, all the civilized European powers were set on one thing, to get a white man, a Christian, to Timbuktu and back. But it would be nearly 300 years before a European made it to Timbuktu and lived to tell the tale. When the Europeans got to Timbuktu and told their governments, well, t actually, the Timbuktu is, is a hellhole, there's nothing here. Um, it went down like a lead balloon. It went down very, very badly indeed, because the Europeans had wanted to be told, yeah, it's, it's fabulous and we're all going to get rich. 
The first to reach Timbuktu and return alive was a Frenchman called René Caillé. He was unimpressed and described the city as a mass of ill-looking houses built of earth. When European explorers finally managed to reach Timbuktu, they were disappointed not to find the huge amounts of gold Leo talked about. But what they missed is the real treasures of the city, the thousands of priceless manuscripts hidden in its libraries. There are in Timbuktu numerous judges, teachers and priests, all properly appointed by the king. He greatly honors learning. Many handwritten books imported from Barbary are also sold. There is more profit made from this commerce than from all other merchandise. Around the 14th and the 15th century, the most rewarding job in Timbuktu was calligraphy. Because Timbuktu was a place of knowledge and wisdom, so there were many, many calligraphers who wrote everything that the wise men said. In the 15th century, there were at least 500 calligraphers in Timbuktu just to reproduce the manuscripts. Here, Spain and Andalusia was to cross Leo's and my path once again. Like me and like Leo, Ismail Haidara's ancestor came from Spain, and he too wrote books about travel and the wider world. In fact, here you have 52 Here we have 52 manuscripts. They are written on goat skin because it's very resistant. Do they last long? Yes, indeed. Especially because of what the goats eat, which makes their skin quite strong. When we talk about Tumbuktu from the 14th century, we talk about the land of gold. But the real gold of Timbuktu is in the head and the manuscripts. It is actually science and culture, the wisdom of people. But you know, there was another kind of gold as well, and it's not material. Timbuktu was a meeting point, a crossing point, where traders coming from the south met those coming from the north. So Timbuktu was a melting pot, and this is the real wealth of Timbuktu. Timbuktu was Leo's first glimpse of the wider world. He was a very young man when he first came here. To Europeans, Timbuktu conjures an image of the most remote place of the planet. But in Leo's time, it was one of the great meeting places in history. In later years, Leo's writings changed Timbuktu. But first, Timbuktu would change Leo. Leo loved Timbuktu and described it well. He loved this city and this is clear in his book which in turn made Italians and others who read his book love it as well. There is a Sudanese proverb that says salt comes from the north, gold from the south, and silver from the land of the white people. But the words of God and knowledge, and the good stories, we only find them in Timbuktu. Timbuktu. The description of Africa would have never made it to Europe if it were not for one monumental event in the life of Leo that propelled him into the heart of the Renaissance and made him one of the world's foremost writers. In the early 16th century, the Mediterranean was a cauldron of rival fates and competing empires. The Ottoman Empire, the Turks, had recently taken control of Egypt. In Europe, 
Pope Leo X was trying to unite European monarchs into a new crusade against the enemy from the east. Taking the war onto the high seas were competing fleets of Christian and Muslim pirates. It was Leo's apparent misfortune to fall into the hands of a Christian privateer in the summer of 1518. Leo had been sent by the Sultan of Fas as an emissary to Constantinople, the capital of the Ottoman Empire. He was returning across the Mediterranean to Africa when he was captured by a ship of the Order of St. John, under the command of a soldier monk named Captain Pietro Bodiviglia, who was looking for plunder and slaves to enrich his order. The order of the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, Rhodes and Malta is in fact the oldest order of chivalry in Europe. A knight had to be 18 years of age, he had to be strong and well built, be prepared to give up his life for the Catholic uh, faith. He also had to be um, an aristocrat, a nobleman, and this brought a lot of wealth to the order. So not only were they noble, but they were educated and they were also very rich. Their main mission at that time was to police, if you like, the North African coast. So it would stretch from Morocco all the way to Cyprus and Rhodes. They took their orders from the Pope. They were answerable to the Pope because the Pope's interest was not just um, the protection of the Catholic faith, or the protection of Rome itself. It was not just a religious war, you see, it was also an economic um, war. Was the Pope happy with their activities in the Mediterranean, namely piracy and privateering? Oh yes, oh yes, for as long as it enriched the order and it kept the Ottoman Turks out of Europe, then he blessed their wars. They had his blessing, definitely. Leo was taken by ship towards Rome, perhaps stopping en route in Malta, then a strategic Christian island in the middle of the Mediterranean. He would have been just one of countless African and Muslim slaves captured by the Knights. We know that uh, at any time during the year there were some 2,000 slaves kept in, in the so-called Banyo. Banyo means a slave prison. There were uh, Muslims and Jews and even Orthodox Christians sometimes. They were kept inside altogether. And these were sold locally to the Grand Masters, to the, to the Knights of St. John, to the nobility. And some of them were even sold abroad. Some of them were exported, so to speak. Certain slaves who were recognized to be important, then of course the Knights treated him differently. Uh, the first thing that they would seek would be to keep him as ransom, political ransom, but also financial uh, ransom, uh, to their enemy. And eventually, if they were found to be uh, of significance, if they were sent to the uh, palaces of Europe, to a prince or to the pope, who would have sought the wisdom or the usefulness of this person in one way or another. Leo's fate was to be sent to Rome as a gift to the Pope. The final stage in his transition from Muslim Arabic scholar to Christian European writer was about to begin. He was imprisoned in the dungeons of Castel San Angelo, the tomb of Hadrian. His survival and his new identity would depend upon capturing the attention of Pope Leo X himself. It would be the Castellans who would let him know that there was this slave who happened to have books with him, who happened to be reading and studying and having maps that would have piqued Leo's curiosity. Leo Africanus would provide a possibility for Leo the Pope to get a look at this other culture that was threatening him, was threatening his existence. The Pope was trying to mount a crusade and Leo Africanus could have helped him in terms of his geographical knowledge about where he was going and how he should plan his military expedition. So evidently Leo Africanus had something to offer to Leo X because otherwise he would have died in the dungeons.